How's it and hello world, another episode of Moving the Needle podcast. If you're new to the show, I'm Andrew Nettling. If you're an avid listener, thanks so much for the reviews, the cool responses. We've had some awesome guests on and I'm super excited because this is the man I think, uh, you know, kind of runs to his own beat of his own drum, if they may say. Super creative, hmm. incredibly gifted on a bike and did one of the craziest, I think I have to call that a stunt on a bike that someone will ever see. <laughs> And I was lucky to witness in person, but he's just an all round good guy, always positive, flashy, creative, loves his fashion, loves his music. Hmm. But enough about that. Um, we're going to get into what makes Thomas Lemoyne, Lemoyne tick. My man, how are you doing today? Oh, good, man. How is it? Yeah, yeah. I can't complain, man. I was super excited that you were keen to come on. You were quick to say yes and... Let me just get back from yeah. from New Zealand, and um, you had a little a little holiday, I think, after New Zealand. That's probably something you yeah. probably like need to do after the long travel and, and stress of these events. Yeah, it's like um, the trip is so long that we always try to stay a little bit more than just the competition time, just to enjoy a little bit of what we can't see every day at home, you know. So we just discover few different places and new zealand is pretty pretty dope like i love it it's um there is sea everywhere and i love um, being near the water so we just love new zealand every time we go so we try to see a little bit of of a new thing every time that was pretty sick we had good weather this time too where did you go where did you go other than where the event is um this time we went to mount manganui it's like not that far from Rotorua. It's a beach city with a, a few, like a lot of surfing. But that time it was not that, like the waves were not that big, but we, just, we still enjoyed the time. It was pretty short this time because the season is so packed that I have a lot of stuff to to do. So I can't really get on holidays on the first trip, but it was sick. It was a good time. I think it's cool that you, even though you're competing at the high level, I also like to maybe tick off a tourist thing, maybe in France, it's the Eiffel Tower, or, you know, it's just in and out. It's not a full <laughs> holiday, but it breaks yeah. up the stress and the long travel and, and like, because everyone's probably your friends are like, oh, you get to go to New Zealand. You're like, yeah, and the airport, the event, and then the airport again sometimes, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes it is like that. Yeah, totally, yeah. man. And... um I mean, I reached out quickly because obviously we we'll, can get into it, but we're we're at this time in your career and life where you've sort of reflected and made a made a big decision to say, you know, uh, I'm successful at competing, but deep down it's probably not for me, even though you've just come from another competition. That's I don't <laughs> think athletes speak out about that. They might just move away and do edits and okay, Seminik's not competing anymore, but you don't always hear his thoughts, right? And you are like, yeah. quick to put your thoughts on paper and, and the industry is super supportive of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I felt like um, I've been, I think I've been um, um, racing at the, the Slopestyle World Champ since 2013, was like my first real entrance to it. So it's almost like it's my 10th year now, my 10th year being like on the Pro Tour and uh, practicing at home for this for this each screen crooks and for those diamonds events and um i felt like with time i discovered a lot more than just freestyle and slope style that i wanted to do more but i every time i'm just taking another bike and going on a trip for like big biking i'm just thinking that i'm not training enough for slope style and stuff like that and the level is going crazy every year in slope style so i always wanted to keep up with it and now I feel like naturally my, my mind just tells me to move on. You know, it's just like, I feel like it's time to take the time to enjoy more, more big biking, you know, and um, I don't want to feel like I'm not practicing enough for, for slope. So I just don't want to give up on slope style too, you know, just I'm like letting the people grow their skills and, um, not doing it myself, so I just thought it was uh, maybe time to to stop slope style contests. But I'm I'm super keen for 
for more events for sure. Like I will still write some speed and styles in Crankworx, and I'm I like the um, the contest feeling, you know, like this adrenaline you have before a run and stuff like this. I feel like I'm not ready to leave that, but I just want to see more trips, different locations, different kind of jumps, events. So I just I just thought I would um, take my time to enjoy a little bit more of everything and not regret anything else that because I'm not like following any special tool. But yeah, if I just want to take my big bike and go to Morzin next week, I'm feeling more free to do it now. So I feel like there is a lot of stuff to do and uh, maybe more time for more video project. And I'm excited to see what's going to happen. <laughs> What I was trying, I mean, I do my research and we know each other pretty well. And I think the big topic is we'll keep unpacking is like moving away and all the whys. But, uh, dude, I got sucked into all the video projects again. So I didn't do like all the analytical research I like to do and find the questions. I was like, these edits are, are so creative and it's, it's so unique. Like it's a hundred, there's no other athlete that could pull off a video like that with the wrapping and all that. But it made mm -hmm. me think how creative you are. And I think you get joy out of that. Like you basically made a music video. You basically made a music video and the action was the riding part. Like some music videos have other styles of action or there is sport included. But it made me think mm -hmm. preparing for slope style seems quite repetitive. Same thing every day. Getting that trick more dialed. Uh, and the yeah. more the sport progressed, it, it seems to chew out athletes because it's kind of the same thing every day. And you almost need to be able to be a, a robot. And that's like a different style of of human. And you seem on yeah. the other side, like super creative, <laughs> want to learn tricks, different tricks. Like you don't always do the the maybe the tricks that are expected to win runs, but you want to do the tricks that like show the Lemoyne style, right? Mm -hmm. Is that like super difficult for you? Like every day, like, okay, I do want to ride my big bike, but I've got to do this like same thing every day. I've got to nail this new trick. Yeah, it was what I was feeling. So that that's kind of why I'm, I think I'm stepping a little bit away from it, but naturally, I think just the fact that I, my one of my biggest dream was to um, take a podium at Joyride for sure. And um, when this happened last year, plus the fact that I did this gap and it was like um, something else than just the podium, I felt like it was the end of this game, you know, for me. And I just had to move on something different. And um, yeah, today when I ride like for my slope style practice. I need to ride more airbags, more front pits to learn more, more like new tricks, you know, new combos. And this is the part I like the less, you know, like being on an airbag or like front pits to me is not really riding. I feel like I'm just going back and forth to something like, like a robot, like you said. So I feel like free riding and the bigger bike world will um, allow me to ride proper bikes anywhere I want and in any different kind of terrain, you know, I can, I'm going to ride everything pretty much just like I'm doing, but we'll, with um, more of everything, just not like 80, maybe 90% of slope style or skate park riding and maybe 10% of big bike. Now I want to switch the thing pretty much. <laughs> is that, uh, is that where slope style went? Like, when they invented the airbag, maybe before that was a foam pit, before that was like a lake jump. Is that just yeah. the natural progression and that's what everyone is doing? Like, is that what slope style training looks like these days? It's just basically airbag. I think we, like, if you want to be a good slope style rider, you have to learn the biggest tricks, obviously. Next to all the skills, you need to be a good rider. But to learn those big tricks, for sure, you can do it on jumps only, but the the process is going to be longer. The fact that you can get more injured is going to, is going to be higher. So, if you have a spot with an airbag on it, you're just going to routine all the tricks every day on it, you know. And there is less risk for you to be injured or to have any problems. So, I feel like it went more into this direction for the competition aspect. But I feel like there is a lot of stuff to do in slope style 
with proper writing still, you know, like there is a lot of ways to be creative. And I feel like maybe when I will have this um, more time, I will still maybe be able to throw some videos on my small bike and that it's going to be just about slope style and maybe skate park. But I feel like to keep up with the tricks that you have to do in contests, I would have to, to ride airbags maybe like five days a week, you know, just to routine, 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 and just that is um, automatic tricks, but with the biggest tricks we could do. So I felt like, yeah, I just want to ride more dirt, more real things. And um, I don't know. I just felt it like it was a natural thinking, you know. I just had a lot of uh, thinking in the winter when we ride a little bit less and maybe less dirt jumping. And then I hop on my big bike and I'm feeling good and I like it. And I'm like, am I like, what am I looking for in slope style anymore, you know? Like, what's my, my big goal? And I didn't find it. So I was like, I have a lot of goals in the anything next to this you know i have like many ideas and uh, goals that i want to try and uh, tick off you know yeah it just seems similar when seminek and reader like you can get to the top of it achieve whatever goal you set out and then it's no yeah. surprise like it's just such a tough sport that kind of like eats you up and spits you up pretty quick right there's the injuries you got to deal with the pr the, the pressure yeah. of like Wow, I've, I can easily get hurt this next event because I'm gonna have to do this this run I'm capable of. But it, it's just like air <laughs> of risk. Like downhill has that for sure, and it's it's like yeah, for five sure. years ago a little bit less, but now the guys there's more competition, so more people willing to push, and the same in slope style. So yeah, it seems like back in the day, would you say more riders would do a safety run the first run, and then maybe the banger run the second run? But now it's like you got to do a banger run to have a chance of any results. So I'm just going to give myself two chances to do the banger run. Has that changed as well in slope style? Um, for me, that I was never like the big trick guy. I always had to, I always had to push myself from the first run. And sometimes I, like in my career, I pushed too much on the first on the first run, and it made me like miss it and then I'm even more like stressed for the second run this is um how I like usually either I land a good first run that I'm happy with and maybe I can improve on the second run but straight after this first run all my pressure everything goes you know I'm like I'm like done but I can add the bonus to that pretty much this is how I feel and when I miss the first run I'm like okay I have one other chance to do it and these last few years, I was more like thinking and thinking that I had two opportunities to land the run I want to land. And I'm like, okay, if I land this first run, I'm going to add a little bit more. But the pressure stays on because I just feel like I'm pushing myself more than I was before. Maybe because I just know this game more and I, I learn more from it. So I know what's going to maybe happen or I don't know. I just want to be a better myself every year you know like when i look at the runs i'm like okay what can i do this year to improve it and that was my last um challenge this year because uh, rotorua was in november last year and after that i felt like i didn't know what's gonna happen for next and i didn't practice so so much this winter like new tricks and stuff i just enjoyed the riding you know i just took my bike and rode whatever I felt like I should ride every day. And um, I just wrote more of everything, but didn't practice my tricks at all. And when I when I went in um, New Zealand this time, so in March, it was like five months later, my only, my only thought were to try and improve the run from last year, just so I'm like proud of myself, but I don't care about what's gonna happen in the result. So that was my main mission. And I, I was surprised that actually I just took it like with more fun because I knew I was out of the tour this year. So I'm not looking for any ranking or maybe the fact that I did this joyride ride last year and got this podium made me just thinking like I should enjoy the, the contest, you know, and I enjoyed way more this year. And 
I felt like I did a good run and I'm super stoked with it. So I feel like being positive and enjoying it is the part I maybe forget sometimes or the stress takes over. And this is the more like, this is how I ride the best pretty much when I'm just like happy to be on the bike with a good bunch of people and trying to do my stuff. I feel like this is, um, this is what I discovered from the last years that the stress doesn't help me being better, but just being enjoying maybe gets me more into the, the mood and in the end do better results. Yeah, but I think that's kind of a <laughs> hidden art to keep the enjoyment under pressure filled situation. Like you said, well, you're not part of the tour, so you're not putting too much pressure on yourself. Yeah. But how do you, th <laughs> I mean, how do you, is it even possible to enjoy some of these slope style events when you're pushing for those results or the podium you haven't got or, you know, at the highest level? Like, I don't know, I can relate like the morning of the <laughs> event, event, you don't want to eat your breakfast. Like it's kind ah. of a relief to get some of it done. So how did you, because you said, oh, I enjoy the pressure. I enjoy competition. I still want to do mm -hmm. some. So walk me through what, what it is like on the day of the event and, and then dropping in, especially when I love when they hold you guys at the top. <laughs> We're like commentating and they're like, yeah. the ad break hasn't finished, but you're there ready to drop. And then you got to yeah. wait. Sometimes it's, it's kind of good. Um, sometimes it's like they make you, they say you can go and you don't really want to go. Like you oh, still take it? another 10 seconds to, to breathe out everything and um, be ready. Uh, I feel like slope style. So I've been racing from the the age of five. Yeah, yeah, so, in BMX, right? Yeah, I I um, experienced a lot of uh, different kind of pressure, I would say. And uh, at that time, when I was younger, I couldn't really eat in the morning, and I was so stressed the full day, and I didn't really enjoy the Sundays, so the racing, the racing moments. And uh, with time, I started to enjoy it more and more. And I feel like now I'm I'm waking up, like I can sleep pretty good the night before. I don't really think about the next day. I'm like trying to get a good sleep. Then I wake up. I'm I know that if I if I have a better breakfast, I'm gonna feel better. So I don't have this stress from the breakfast on. You know, I just wake up and I feel like a lot of guys are pretty chill. Like we we always take breakfast like five or six guys together. Everyone is uh, taking a lot of food to make sure we got good energy. Um, I feel like the vibe in slope style is pretty chill. So when you start, even the joyride day, when you start practicing, everyone is for sure under pressure and it's not like the jam session we, we all dream of, but everyone is still in the good vibe, like most of us, you know, and there is always one guy that is super positive and hype the boys and... It's more like we're going to war together, you know, like, yeah, yeah. it's like, okay, today we know what we have to do. Everyone has to do his own things. We are going to maybe crash. Maybe not. Let's see. It's more like something like that. And, um, for sure the two hours before the show is super stressful and you're trying to adjust every little aspect of the run and trying to be ready. But this is something I very like, to be honest. Like, I just feel like. At this moment, everyone wants to say, we hate this, you know, and one hour later, you're like, wow, this is the best thing ever, you know, even if maybe you crash twice. Sometimes I just feel like you have to crash, maybe miss two runs to understand why and how you can improve yourself to maybe do better the next time. Sometimes it's not even about the tricks. It's just like everything that comes around that makes you lose it, you know. Like yeah, I've seen that... some guys that are like super 100% perfect in practice and in the end don't make it in the run because of um, like mental, like not the, the best mental, I would say, going into the runs. Yeah, but you're right. You guys, there is a, a level of like feeling like, yeah, like you said, you're going to war. We never like relating it to that. <laughs> but I say that's why we have a bond, you know, the downhillers or everyone that goes to a Crankworks event, like you're there, you can relate to each other. But yeah, the slope style guys, there really is an awesome level of camaraderie. Like, you know, Gregatkin's always famous at the bottom for just like being so pumped <laughs> yeah. on other people's big runs, right? Even when he has a crash and, 
you know, he could have had a chance yeah, to win. Sure. Like, I'm, I'm super impressed with him and you. Like, everyone's positive. Like you say, you you always want the guys to get through healthy and, and put down their good runs. So that is actually quite a cool thing leading up. Like, the vibe is different. Like, a BMX race or a downhill, you know, you have a set training yeah. time. you got to get up, set trade, warm up, then set training, and then you got to wait for your race. So it's like mm-hmm. scheduled shit, but if you and, can ease into yeah. it and it's like a jam format. If I'm feeling a bit nervous, I do a few chilled runs maybe to get, you know, to get the feeling of the bike. Yeah. And the fact that I feel like when you do racing or like downhill or you, you just race against the clock or sometimes against other people, but everyone does the same thing. There is only one point and it's to go down and be probably first or like the best and in slope style i feel like it's more of a personal fight for each of us because we don't have the same tricks we're not going to do the same runs so everyone is fighting against himself more than against the clock or against the other riders so i feel like this is maybe how we like support more each other's i don't know I just feel like I don't I don't see any competition with Emil or Eric or oh, Nikolai really? or Paul Kuderk or you know like I feel like he's gonna do his trick I'm gonna do my tricks and um, if I do a better run and the judge think I do a better run then I'll be placed in front of them you know but in the end it's just like I know what I can do because I'm riding for it every week so if what I think I can do every week at home, I did it in this in this run. And to me, it's like I won. So sometimes I I don't even remember the um, the ranking I had on some events because I just like I just cared about the run I could do and if I was proud of it. And my to me, my biggest competition is when I look at the run after all before posting it, and I'm like seeing if there is everything anything I think it's like bad looking or could be better in my run and this is the the clip i'm gonna watch and watch and watch just to see how i could make it better so when i'm like when i'm super proud of a run it's like when i look at the run and i'm saying like this is a good run you know like this is a good looking run or like this trick was pushed completely not like i don't know the landings i i look at everything but i'm like looking at my stuff so I don't feel like I should be any angry against anybody else in the in the slope style world. You know, I'm just like I'm super impressed and uh, inspired by some of the guys. So I I just look at them and trying to get inspired from it more than thinking that I should be in a competition with them. When it comes to speed and style, then it's different. But I kind of feel the same. Like in the end, I just do my quali. And where I'm placed in the ranking, maybe sometimes I'm first, sometimes I'm like fourth or whatever. I'm just trying to see where I do in quali and then how I can do in the in the finals. So sometimes I'm like qualifying first and I'm like, okay, this is possible, you know. If you made it in quali, maybe you can do it to the end. So if you ride good, no mistakes, do the tricks, you see what happened, you know. So every time I'm like losing a speed and style or like going out in a semi or quarters or something, I just think that I, I missed, you know, I should be better on this run or this, this uh, left corner or these things. So I feel like it's a better, better, better for my brain to think about myself having to be better than looking at the others and get angry if someone is better than me. (laughs) <laughs> yeah i think it's i'm super impressed because i think that's why you're so consistent uh, with your results and with Maybe. and with the winning because you're focusing on yourself and i think downhill yeah. actually can be similar but often it's not because you've got that time and you're like well yeah. he did that time so clearly i could have done that time but that's a comparison to someone else can you realistically yeah. have done that time on that course with whatever was going on in your life. And you're saying, well, in slope style, you kind of, it's easier to just compare yourself to yourself because you kind of came into the event with your tricks, your plan. And if a meal's coming in with new stuff you didn't know about, well, you can't <laughs> really do much else if you don't have more tricks. There's a certain combo maybe yeah. you've been holding back that you know is 50-50. 
that you can mm -hmm. maybe try. But I think that's incredible to just stay in your lane, even with speed and style. Okay, well, that's as fast as I felt I could go. That's the tricks yeah. I was prepared to do. So yeah, someone else was better on the day. And that's a good way to look at downhill, but it's maybe more difficult because you're like, well, I beat him before. Why didn't I yeah. beat him on this track? And it's like, well, maybe he's just better on that track or his mental game was better that day. So I think that's a huge, yeah. huge lesson is like just try and compare yourself to yourself. You know, like how, yeah, can, this is, how can you be better? That's interesting. Yeah, this is how I felt like it got like more natural in my mind like for me to grow either my skills or my my mental into these um, competitions so i just felt that i just i should keep going this way you know it's quite yeah it's awesome do you think some riders get caught up with comparing you know with emil now he's clearly you know, dominating Regatkin ha has his big runs and, and does different style tricks. Like are there riders that go Sh shucks, I've got to do that trick now. To me, it looks like I didn't ask everyone, but it looks like Emil is a good motivation for a lot of um, riders in this tour. Like the fact that he won so much events and he always win if he lands a good like a good run from him makes the others more angry to be better themselves but it looks like everyone is trying to grow their runs with their style like when i see david godziek i see some bigger moves every time same as nikolai but in the same way they used to ride you know like they just grow the runs and maybe they try to improve their self to maybe beat Emil at some point. I feel like I feel like some people really want to win, you know, now that it's a rare thing to be able to win when um, Emil is here. But I feel like it's a good motivation. I see it as motivation when I see the other guys like let's say the top two, three, four that is trying to to get him every time. For sure, I think that those guys are trying to be better themselves, but also think about how they could, you know, beat the king, I would say. So I don't know how everyone feels, but I feel like the fact that Emil is just um, on another level gets everyone more motivated and everyone is practicing more, I feel like. So the sport is maybe growing faster thanks to guys like him, you know? Yeah. And they... Like, not everyone is trying to ride like Emil. Like, there is for sure a lot of um, influence riders that are going to try to be the next Emils. Like, we've seen with a lot of riders, like with Brandon and then Brett. And you can even see some some riders that look like Nikolai, you know, that are inspired from him and do the same kind of tricks and with no visors. So I feel like each big riders make his own um, little... Um, like new ones but i feel like it's to me like the fact that it, there is someone that is so much let's say up to the game is um could be either a low a low motivation or a push and i feel like for now it's a push for a lot of a lot of the guys you know i've seen so much guys working more and more making new backyards buying airbags and um, getting like after it so that's that's good for the sport. Yeah, no, definitely. It's such an individual niche, niche sport. And <laughs> there's only a few of you that get to compete at a Crankworks. And obviously there's diamond events or those other events. Yeah. Is it, is there a, is it fair to, I'm going <laughs> to, let me try get this out. Do you think we can say who's the greatest slope styler of our like last generation? Like in your mind now, ah. you're not you're not gonna compete as much anymore. So like who impressed you the most? Is it like Emil's way of just knocking out these runs so consistently? Was it Semenek back in the day because he probably pushed the sport the most back then? Then you mm -hmm. had Reader that came in and, and maybe almost learned from Semenek. But now you got Emil that was like under those guys. Like if they were all yeah. at their best, all at a comp, I mean, what would that look like? This is a hard question, actually. I think this is the question everyone would like to have the, the answer and see in real life. Um, I don't really know, to be honest. 
I, I don't think it's that... a fair question. It's not a fair question to ask you. It's not a fair question, but <laughs> yeah, I I, just, I, I respect man. a lot the fact the fact that Emil um, has been able to put like maybe twelve or I don't remember how much, but like winning runs in uh, Crankworks is always like to win a Crankworks that I've I've never won a Crankworks slop style. I feel like this is one of the hardest thing you can do and when you won maybe 10 i don't know how much you won but like 10 or 12 i feel like this has to prove that you are one of the best and i know that a lot of people could think that he does the same kind of tricks all the time because it's too technical for for a lot of people to understand it but when i know him since a kind of like long time now i know all the tricks he can do and maybe some of some of the um, spectators never never even seen from Emil I think he's one of the best because he can just do everything to me one of the best in general means that you are one of the best on any kind of bike so then for this I have other other thoughts but as a slope style rider, to me, Emil is probably one of the best we've seen, like we've ever seen, because the fact that you can stress and manage to go over this stress and land 10 times the biggest run of the comp with 15 of the best athletes in the world, I think it has to be one of the best ever, you know? Yeah, I think that's I feel a, like, a fair answer. I don't know if... Yeah, I don't know if Semenuk like and Reader won that much. Yeah, it was like a natural progression that he, the sport has got to where it is, and he's the guy at the top. So his skill level is yeah. is pretty intense. Um, but you mentioned if you include other bikes or other styles, you look at other people for inspiration, or who impresses you there? Um, yeah, I've been always impressed by by people that are able to to get a super good level at every kind of riding. So like when I see someone like Kate Edwards, to me, yeah. it's, it's one of the best mountain bikers I know because when I share a session with him in a skate park, sometimes I almost feel like he's too good, you know, like how come can he be this good when I'm riding five days a week a skate park and maybe two or one day a week for him. And then I go to the bike park and he's like 20 meters away from me. And then um, I see him racing World Cups and can do pretty pretty well over there. I feel like that means he can just control any kind of bike. And this is this is how I really like get impressed by riders or inspired. So for sure, Brenda and Brett showed us that they were able to ride anything. Also, and there is a lot of riders that are super good at everything. But if I just see a guy that is only good at slope style forever. I'm going to be thinking he's a good slope style rider, but to be like one of the best bike riders to me, you have to know how to ride everything pretty much. Or I give you like an enduro bike on this kind of spot. And if you impress me, then to me, you're maybe a good like potential bike rider. And then you're going to do a tail whip and then you're going to do a, a World Cup of uh, downhill. I feel like, you know, if you if you control every aspect of the riding, like you can you can be you can know I don't know how to say, but like if you know the matrix of everything, then you can ride good at everything and adapt to anything, I would say. So that's why I always tried also to ride everything just to like when I'm riding, I don't know, my enduro bike in the street on some stairs, I always think that I'm still doing something, you know, I'm still riding. So I'm still doing something for my biking skills. And maybe yeah. I'm, I'm going to like take benefits from it on a slope style jump at some point, you know. I feel like riding everything is something really important and I love it. So sometimes I'm just taking a bike and I'm like 30 minutes on the parking lot and I'm like, okay, let's have fun. What can I do? Like, how am I going to spend this time and not be like sitting on my bike and being on the phone? And I'm like, okay, there is a little thing there. I'm going to try some tricks there. And then I'm going to try a manual. And then you grow your creativity, I would say, and your skills just doing it. 
And this is what I like. And that's why I, I got less and less into the slope style practice because when I'm like on a trick jump, there is a rolling and a jump, you know? The only fun you can have on this really when the landing is probably a resi or mooch or even like soft dirt, you can't really like have fun except as doing tricks. And when you do tricks every day in the, in the same way of thinking that, okay, these tricks I need to work on because the judges, I mean, because my run is going to be like that because of the judges, because there is some tricks I always wanted to learn and I didn't really learn them because I was focused on other things for my runs, you know, for my contest. I was like, I'm not going to do this in a contest. So let's put this on the side and I'm going to do this. And now I feel like I want to learn tricks that I never really learned before and maybe i'm just gonna put them in an edit or i'm just gonna do them when i'm thinking like i should do them you know and i don't want to follow this like this process where i'm like trying to be better for my runs for my slope style runs so i feel like all of this made me you know like this big bubble that i found this winter made me think like I should just ride bikes and just listen to myself. So I just try to, uh, I, I was scared because for the last 10 years, I was just doing the same, the same routine. So I knew that if I was in the top 10, I was pretty safe for my career and with my sponsors that this is what they expect from me. If I do podiums, then this is bonus, but this is cool. And I was like, now I'm going to be out of the slope style thing, but this is only what I did for now. So how is the world going to react to this? How am I going to bounce from this? And uh, what can I do with um, with everything else, you know? Did so now you... I'm figuring out. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Did you chat to the sponsors first? Because you said you were scared probably to put out that post and change directions. Like what came first? Did you just keep it inside and make the decision or did you check if you'd have enough support, if you move in another direction? Um, I checked, but I didn't really ask. I was just like, um, some of my contracts are mainly based on Crankworks. And I was, um, I was more like scared to tell them that I maybe not going to do all the Crankworks this year, but it was in my contract. And I also was like, I don't know what they, they think about me as uh, someone else than uh, a, a Crankworx writer, you know? So I was like, um, not really known what's going to be the answers. And uh, for sure, I told them that I have new visions and I want to do new things and have more time for uh, different stuff. And um, everyone was pretty, pretty chill with it in the end and respect my... Uh, my way of thinking and uh, just the um, the message my my brain sends me, you know, like it's it's been really natural. Like when I went back from the season and start riding again, I was like having a lot of thought. Like I don't really want to do a 360 double whip today. I just want to like cruise and ride this, these trails. And uh, I've been riding way more chill stuff this winter. And I enjoyed, I enjoyed a lot more. And I was like, maybe I should, um, I should uh, listen myself and maybe not like stay too long in this routine if I don't feel like I need it anymore. You know, I don't want to be forced myself. Like I don't want to force myself to do stuff because I felt like I always did it by passion, like by patient. When I started yeah. riding mountain bike, I didn't even know money exists in this world and I could do this as a job, you know, I was like 12, 13. So at that age, you just ride with patient. And I just feel like I kept going in the same way of thinking. And then I obviously got to be pro. So I got to learn and know how it is and how to be professional for sure. But I never lost any, any joy, you know, when I'm riding, if I don't feel like I should go ride, I just go to the studio and I don't ride for two or three days sometimes. And then when I'm back on the bike, I feel like so happy to be there because I'm just like, I feel like listening myself is what I, what makes me feel best for my, my whole life pretty much. So 
my mom says that I I'm super hard with this because I just listen myself and I do what I want and stuff like that sometimes. But I feel like it's been um, helping me to be happy in life. So yeah, and it just, seems like you caught do... you caught yourself before you lost the joy totally, right? Yeah, and and maybe achieving that goal was a way that you pushed through not wanting to do a 360 bar spin or whatever in training and okay, I need to get this cleaner because you knew you had set a goal like you think you can get a Crankworx podium um, yeah. and then sort of be careful what you wish for. Then you get it and you go, oh, okay, that feels pretty good. I don't desire to win the event or it's not realistic <laughs> right now. Or I don't have the drive for that. And then you're like, hang on. There isn't the why, right? The carrots disappeared. You've got the carrots. And now you've got to find that new carrot. I don't know if you know that mm -hmm. saying in English. Yeah. Um, you know, if you dangle I always the, say it too. Yeah, you dangle the carrot. Now you've got to find a new a new carrot. But um, <laughs> were you surprised at this level of support you got when you released the post? Because I think people really respect someone that can um, be authentic. So be themselves, which you've always been which has got you a level mm -hmm. of success, but then go, yeah, people expect me to be slope style, expect me to be competitive. I'm good. I'm at the top of the game. I just got a podium last year. And now you're saying, well, at the top of the game, I'm going to walk away and do something different, not from the whole sport. But I think a lot of people respect that. And I was quick to comment and I saw the comments from, mm -hmm. from your fellow colleagues in the sport, you know, not just fans. I think they mm -hmm. probably... Uh, are probably motivated to do more of that themselves when they see you willing to do that. Take a risk, move away. Yeah, maybe. Maybe I've I've been also like um, thinking this way because I've seen some of the older legends, I would say, that took the same decisions at some point. I just felt like I've been actually riding for like 10 years on this tour, so... If and I you, was just doing you're a... 26, sorry. You're like... Now, yeah. Yeah, you're still uh, super young, I'm, 27. I'm probably nine years and this is my 10th. Okay. So I was like, when I was 17, it was my first proper year on some Diamonds event and where I did my first draw ride. Um, this was 2014. And before even my first draw ride, I was like trying to do those gold and uh, silver events for actually two years, I think. So I've been in this thing for a long time, you know. If I had this podium at Joy Ride when I was maybe 18, I would maybe need for more because at that time I was just like uh, loving slope style mostly. But now I, I feel like I'm I'm grown and I enjoy a lot a lot of different things in biking that I'm not able to to get the chance to ride every day so i'm like i want to have this opportunity to ride more of this enduro bike more of this free ride bike if i want to do this i want to go there if i want to ride bmx i never ride my bmx because i'm i'm not feeling good when i'm going from a uh, slope bike to bmx and i never really ride it in the end because i'm like scared to not be as good feeling on my on my DJ bike for every contest and I don't want to feel like I need to ride for this next contest anymore you know I just want to ride because I love it and I feel like I'm going to be more creative and open every day to to just do something different or something that I feel like it's good to do do you remember that first comp like you were saying you know, you didn't know you could make money from the sport and, yeah. and like walk me through moving from BMX racing to dirt jump um, and then like, oh, I'm going to enter a comp and then, yeah. Yeah, BMX, BMX racing was like something that I got into um, randomly pretty much with my dad. Like my dad just took me to some sports on a Wednesday and uh, we tried BMX and apparently said that I loved it and I wanted to do more laps. So my dad just um, took like a BMX license to me and um, license. And I, I just got to go to the trainings and then to my first con competition and then more and more. And I've been into world champs in 2004, I think. My first world champs. 
And um, what was the question again? Because I'm just going no, through my... No, no, no. I, I, I'm, I want to understand going through the history of your biking. Okay. And like getting from BMX to... Oh, how did I... Jumping okay. and then maybe your first comp. Yeah, let's hear it. I don't <laughs> so know the full I did, history. Um, <laughs> I did those World Champ in 2004. I got third. Um, for the for the live story, I was the only guy with uh, flat pedals because Sick. every every other country than France had clip pedals since the young age, and we we were like not allowed to. So um, I had flat pedals on my first world champ. Uh, got third. I raced BMX for like another until my like 11, 12, and I was let's say in France always one of the best in my category you know in my in my age and i felt like a lot of uh, anger and um i couldn't say jealousness but like some people wanted to make me crash because i was like winning maybe too much races so it was a super um, it was more of an angry sport you know to me and i felt more competition and more like fight against the others i felt that so much that at some point i just tell my dad that i was not enjoying anymore you know even at the practice i was like going to the to the racetrack and maybe sometimes i was trying to do a one footer or like some little tricks and um some of the um, the teachers were not that supportive for that they were like this is racing you you here to race you don't have your gloves today you have to wear gloves and all of these things made me get less um enjoying it less enjoying it and someday i just went to a um, mountain bike dirt jump contest like in france um maybe you know momo christophe morera he was organizing this uh, the guy from um not ringing he had bell. santa cruz bikes before oh is it um okay he's uh commenting i mean well, yeah for some uh, style he's uh, super famous but he was like um MC for Rock Dazer and stuff like that. Uh, and he was okay. the first guy that that got me into the sponsorship in mountain biking. So he was giving me my first bikes and uh, first parts and helmets and stuff like that. And um, I've seen this comp and I was like, everyone looks like they're enjoying it. You know, I don't see any competition in between the guys. And I felt like this was so weird because when I was, when I was into race BMX world it was like completely opposite and I was like this looks pretty cool and um, after this first comp I asked my dad if maybe we could try do that and he was like yeah we'll see and I I kept going to the BMX tracks but not really thinking I would do a lot more you know in my in my mind I was not practicing that much for physical stuff and, and uh, stuff like that and uh, one day I think for my birthday my dad uh, brought me like a uh, um Cannondale Chase I think my first real DJ bike I had some mountain bikes before but not really in the way that I could do slope style you know so this was my first DJ bike where I was gonna be able to start being a slope style rider just because I've seen some guys and I didn't even know New World Disorder and nothing from mountain bike world at that time and uh I got when I grew up I just go a little bit faster, but when I grew up, I got to meet Yannick Granieri. That was pretty much the guy that made me understand a lot of things about mountain biking, and he helped me a lot with the tricks, and he was living one hour away from me. And even before I had my car, I was taking train to like near him, and I was riding with him for like two or three days, and then my mom were like driving me back from his place. And... Um, I lot like I I learned a lot with him of skills of riding of like um he was he was super super active pretty much so I got to do a lot of different stuff in biking where I saw I was not um feeling super good on the bike so I discovered a lot of stuff that I could improve about myself being on the bike and this is what made me maybe like start getting into it more and more and I think I got my first contract when I was 17. So the year, pretty much the year where I did my first joyride, I was having my first contract already because I was like maybe in the top 20 before, like in 2013. 
And after I got to Joyride, I got signed by uh, Resolution. So that is my agent since that, pretty much. Oh, since back then already? You've been um, with them? 2014, yeah. Wow, that's cool. And I signed with Canyon in December 2014 or like um, end of 2014. And I'm, um, I'm still with them for now. And yeah, I just got to, to write more contests, get to know more people and um, learn tricks and do different kind of events. So that was a good, uh, good and long uh, way, I would say. Like when I see sometimes I did some um, crank crooks where I did three events each, maybe I raised like 40 or like, yeah, maybe 40. I don't even know. I should calculate it, but like so much even in crank crooks. I feel like now I just go to a speed and style and I know it so well that I don't even have no pressure. I just have the, you know, the, the fun of it. And I could be feeling like in race BMX where at some point it was all the same and I didn't enjoy it, but I just love riding the speed and style course. I just love riding the slope style course. So I felt it a lot this year when I went to the course every morning to ride the practice. I never said myself it was practice time and I had to practice the run tricks. I was like, let's get a sesh with the boys, you know, like all winter I'm riding alone and I'm riding with that, that kid Edgar and a team that is two hours away from me and a little bit of Tommy G that is two hours away also. And when I'm there, I'm just with all the boys and I just feel like this is a good time, you know, like I, I if you ever experience a good sesh with Nikolai Rogatkin, you feel so much hype and so much... Um, good moments that you don't even want to think about the scary trick or what can I do to, to do this good one. You just start and you do the good sesh and then you're like, okay, what are we doing? New trick, blah, blah, blah. And then it goes like that. And some tricks this year I didn't do for all winter. And I got to do them in a train with Fedco. Like Fedco was like, yo, we do train. And I was like, yeah, what are we doing? And it was like three dubs. And I was like, free double whip. I didn't do this trick all winter because my slope bike, I I got to like no more the slope bike because I just took a bike with shocks only this winter. And I had a DJ bike for a long time before. And I was like, I don't know if I can do it. And he was like, let's do it. And he, he started dropping in. And then I was like, okay, I have no choice, you know? And I dropped and I did that free double. And it made me like think I could do it in my run just because of the the hype of the moment you know so this is what i'm i'm enjoying the most when i'm riding bikes and this is what i'm looking for having more you know so i'm going to dark fest um oh you are in the next couple of weeks yeah and i've been Sick. like i wanted to do it for so long and um i'm so happy that this Dude, comes you're gonna at the, love it man you're gonna at the right it. time yeah I, I hope so. Yeah, this I, is, I feel like it. I don't sure. know when I'm going to drop this episode. The dark fest might be done, but uh, okay. I, was th I was there and we did a little testing. Well, some testing. Yeah. With, yeah, yeah. Dude, and that, the little test session, like I don't ride my downhill bike with those type of guys like ever, yeah. right? So it, For I'm sure. excited to go out there. And like you said, there's this crazy feeling. And I think it is like what got us into bikes when you're a kid and you learn a new trick. And there was this thing that needed to be tested. Um, yeah. It's probably, I don't know, like I said, I don't want to drop this out. And there was the feeling like not to do it before the guys. That wasn't the thing. It was that feeling of like, okay, I'm nervous, but I think it'll go well. And this is, you know, and when you're a kid, yeah. like just hearing you speak about that got me excited for you. And <laughs> it makes sense. Like, I think you doing these jam sessions with the guys must feel like what those first few comps were like for you because everything's new you're excited to ride with all these guys you probably looked up to yeah yeah i feel like this is what i enjoyed the most in in biking in the end like just the fact that having a a good group of guys that are like motivated by the same thing but that are able to do different things in the same world I think this is so sick. I feel like, you know, I love this thing. And um, I'm a big fan of this trick where my one of my best friend doesn't like that trick at all. But we like the same patient. We like the same writers. We listen the same kind of music. 
And in the end, we just go to the same spot. We enjoy two hours of riding and we don't do the same things. I feel like this is so inspiring and motivating. And um, that's why I feel like I almost regret that I didn't enjoy more of my slope style uh, practice before. Like some years I was like so stressed going into practice. We were like, you know, like you just think about your tricks and you don't even think it's going to be a sesh with the boys. You just think this is practice i have to go and do those tricks and i'm scared of these and i don't know if i can land that one over there and i feel like the last years i've been happy to ride when i when i wanted so i'm not the guy that is gonna ride from 9 a.m to to 5 p.m in practice usually i just take my time i just listen myself when i feel like i have the good power i do it but i just felt like when i go I just enjoy it and um, there is a good bunch of guys that are super inspiring on course so just looking at them and riding with them is just what I like mostly in every kind of thing so I feel like events like fest and those kind of jams this is what I I want to just do more like I've been to Freeride Fiesta also in January it was just a jam that Johnny Salido organized and with every kind of riders almost, you know, every different kind of riders and everyone was just here on on one line and everybody can do whatever he wants. Like you can just ride the last step up, you can just do tricks, you can cruise, you're free to do what feels better for you. And it feels like everyone is just happy to to be able to do what they want. And you can see some proper good riding when you see this kind of... Uh, this kind of mood, I would say. Yeah, exactly. It's less of a, there's a bit of competition, but not really. It's more like the level of hype. If mm -hmm. one guy stomps what he was working on and you're like, okay, it looks like you're like, yeah. well, then I'm kind of motivated to stomp what I was thinking I can maybe, maybe do. And uh, I can relate, you know, I, and I think that's the, that's the, such a catch 22, we say in, in competitive sport is you get into it because you love it and it's a passion and then yeah. it becomes a job. And when it becomes a job, there's certain things you can't avoid, like the pressure. Like I could say, yeah, I don't think I enjoyed all my practice on a downhill course. I used to, as a kid, I yeah, love practice. And then it's like, well, <laughs> practice is cool, but there's that gap I have to do if I'm going to be uh, up at the top of the field and you as well, like, well, I can't do a safety run because then I'm going to get 15th and, and mm -hmm. I expect or want to be fifth at this event. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's definitely all the advice I would give to my younger self or anyone coming up is what you've just mentioned, like the gratitude, you know, which is being appreciative of something and, and remembering why you got into it. And it's going to be, yeah. there's going to be shit days. But if you say, well, how do I make this more fun? Um, cause you'll probably perform better anyway. Yeah. I feel like with time I've experienced a lot of, uh, different mood and, uh, I've tried a lot of different techniques maybe. And, uh, I feel like when I'm just, I just try to feel good myself is the best, best times. I feel like, like in Whistler, Whistler, I always kind of been happy with all the results I had. And I always felt like Whistler was the holidays, you know, more than the final of the world tour. We went to Whistler every time with a, with a bunch of friends, different friends, uh, every time. And I always like, this is Whistler. This is where I dreamed I could go when I was younger, you know? So now I'm here. I'm not going to stress for nothing. Like this is joy ride. I'm going to ride the, this event that I did the years before too, but that was my dream 10 years ago. And I'm here and I'm enjoying everything I can. I'm just going party. Sometimes I'm like, wow, this is, it's 2 a.m. Is it not too late to to go back and race the speed and style tomorrow? And sometimes I'm like, no, because I'm going to wake up and, and feel happy because I just do whatever, you know, and I'm going to breakfast. And then when it's the competition, you just keep focus. And you know, like, I'm practicing for this all year so. I'm just like, I enjoy everything I can do. And then when I'm on the, on the gate, I just like, I try my best, you know, I'm just thinking like every time I put my feet on my pedal, it's to try my best. If I don't feel like I, I can do good, I will try the best I can do with this feeling. And 
I would try to. Oh, sorry, I got into Siri. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Is Siri trying to? I is Siri going to help you, you answer I, the question? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, maybe because I said something. Um, what was the saying? He <laughs> got me. You were, he got me stressed. I was like, oh no. <laughs> you were speaking about being in the gate of like a speed and style and oh, saying, yeah. and you put your feet on the pedals. And I was going to actually ask you, what does the self talk <laughs> look like before a slope style or a speed and style? Or like, are there times you have to just say, okay, I've worked all my life for this. I got the talent. Let it go. Like, yeah. do you actually have conversations with yourself, and what are they? Some sometimes I have when I when I have this kind of conversation with myself, it's when I'm not hundred percent confident on what's gonna happen. Speed and style to me is more of an experience, so I never really stress for it. It's just adrenaline, and each run is like more stressful because you know you have to be faster and cleaner and learn all the tricks. But this is more of a personal exercise to me. When slope style, sometimes you just feel like you're going to get injured or like maybe if you miss that trick or that gap, you're going to break your two knees, you know, and you're like, am I ready for this? Or am I, uh, do I know how to do this double flip again? Sometimes I'm just like 10 minutes before my run, seeing the guys riding. And I don't even know if I can ride bikes anymore. You know, I'm like, <laughs> I'm thinking like weird. And I, I usually listen to a lot of music. This is my uh, my way of being uh, in my zone. I love to listen to some music. But yeah, there is that feeling where I'm like thinking I can't do no tricks anymore. You know, like I'm gonna for uh, I forgot how to ride the bike. Like, am I gonna do this first drop? And then when the guys say you can go. I'm always waiting a little bit. I'm like making sure when I drop, it's when I decide to drop when like, it's not when the guy tells me to do it. So I don't feel like I'm, I'm rushed. And then I just uh, breathe a last time. Like I just throw my last, uh, my last breath and I just drop in and I switch off pretty much. Like, it's just like automatic, you know, I just go and suddenly I just know everything I have to do. Like it was, uh, plan forever and sometimes it goes well sometimes it doesn't um i just try to understand why it doesn't go well when it doesn't and um uh, i just love it man i feel like this feeling even the feeling that i feel like i'm so bad on the bike oh, i don't even know again i, I went still, to syria again oh you can still okay I think so. I don't know why. But maybe um, Siri AI is keeping an eye on us, man. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, when I when I I take my bar and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna drop. This is the moment. I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I'm able to do all these tricks again, but I did it all week, so I could do it. This moment I really like it. I just feel like this is um you know, this adrenaline that some guys, they are maybe drug addict and they say they can't go out of this. I feel like it's almost what I feel when I'm having um, this kind of runs and this kind of pressure on my bike. But I feel like maybe it's better to do to have this kind of uh, addiction. So I just keep it going that way. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Mostly I would agree. Yeah, it's, it is. Do a you feel of like, addiction. did yeah? you ever feel like near the top that you you don't know how to write down this course or like you don't remember the track well, or did you ever feel like that? I feel like there is a lot of guys that. Yeah. Well, I think, I think no, hundred percent. I think I'm sure the everyday rider might be like, what? This guy is one of the best in the world. And he has doubts. You're doubting your level of skill. I think I've certainly, yeah, mentally, for sure, always doubts. And then for me, I, you know, you're replaying the run or what you want yeah. to do. And then I learned kind of a hack of like, let me replay the first turn how I wanted to go and the rest will take care of itself. But when I didn't prepare very well, then I might crash in the first turn. Or well, that could happen. Mm-hmm. But there was okay. definitely a race where I qualified so well. It was in Leo Gang, maybe top five. And obviously the expectation and all this stuff. I mean... 
I crashed like three times before the first split. So in the first 40 seconds, it was a muddy race, but <laughs> I think my body wouldn't actually physically work very well yeah. because I didn't deal with the, the emotions and the pressure. So yeah, it happens, man. It happens to the best of us. It's, <laughs> but I think I think people listening might be like, holy shit, even he doubts and we're all human. Emotion is yeah. human, you know, like it doesn't matter how good you are, you're going to doubt, can you do it today? Am I good enough? Um, and then yeah, maybe sure. working through that mentally is quite fulfilling, you know, to be like, yeah, I pushed through an uncomfortable feeling. Yeah, I feel like if you just cruise up to a crank works and you show up the day of the finals, and you look at the riders one hour before the show, you probably gonna see, gonna think at least that some of them are in dubs for sure. Some of them looks like they control everything. I don't know if I look like I control everything, but I'm I'm thinking, I feel like I always have a lot of um, self thinking before the runs and I'm like either on my bike next to it on a parking lot or like anything that I can find or listening music and trying to forget the, um, this feeling where I think I can't ride bikes anymore. <laughs> well, um, I'm just fascinated. We keep talking about oh, Whistler, right? Are you battling with you. Siri? Oh, I Are do you hear you again. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's all good. We we said off air that we both hate technology. We appreciate it, but we <laughs> hate it. We crap. So I like it. If but there's I'm any just technical yeah, if there's any technical glitches, we're not experts at yeah. at technology. But um <laughs> yeah, so I'm aware of it, but I think there's a different feeling that just before a uh, slope style, if you you can actually feel the energy. I feel it at like a downhill world champs. Uh, when I was at Leger, walking yeah. past Amory, walking past ben, Benoit, I was like, "Oh, this is race morning." I can, f you can feel the energy in the air. It's yeah, it's in, for it's super, sure. And slope style for me is the same. You know, the practice is fun to watch, and then you know, depending on what role I have that day, if I'm spectating or in the finish doing some interviews, yeah. And the closer you get to the five minutes before the event everything is heightened right and for the athletes as well you know some don't mm -hmm. want to talk some are very talkative depends on their personality you're probably buried in your headphones that's how you prepare. <laughs> yeah but that's why i say to everyone like you've got to go to these events you've got to like feel the energy yeah i feel like when i've when i've been to the world cup in leger i felt like a lot of the the state of minds or like the state of feeling that I um, um, experienced myself, you know, like when I see the guys, when I see, when I when we went on top, we saw them like being with the mental preps and like the guys with them, like doing games and um, some of them have music, some of them do the same, you know, like trying to move the full body. And this is, we do all the, the same things pretty much, you know, like this is what we do before our runs. And um, I feel like this is just uh, maybe the same feeling for a boxer before he's gonna go and uh, and have to fight on the on the scene. You know, I don't know. I feel like this is the the pre pre even thing. And some guys are super chill. Like I I met some guys that never was stressed about competing because they always took it fun, but. Every time I've seen some guys on the podium, I feel like they've experienced that feeling that we all do because there is a, a moment where you maybe want to win or want to do good that much that there is all this pressure that comes into you. And this is just a matter of uh, how you play with it, with this, you know? Well, like, you, you would think that if you don't get nervous, you don't care enough, right? And if you don't care enough, why are you there? So I maybe when like, you yeah. when you get to the point that like, oh, this is super fun and chill, I'm not nervous, maybe that's when it's like, okay, well, I'm not needing to be competitive anymore, you know? Yeah. Some guys are not competitive. Like they've been into slope style and they were doing what they liked and they didn't try to be a lot better. And I respect it also because it's just a matter of how happy you are. Like, um, 
we all do whatever we think it's better to do in our life just to in the end be happy i would say i feel like everything we try in life is the result is to try and be happy so i just respect how like however you want to be happy but i feel like if you want to win or be a better uh, competitor and you have to push yourself you know and when you push yourself you push the limits and you you feel the pressure you feel adrenaline you feel the stress you feel you have to feel all, all those things and um yeah i think this is what what makes the the sports also being so interesting because this is like how much you put like from your soul into it in the end you know like we all f i feel like we all kind of feel the same feelings we just um experience it differently and some of like there is many way to deal with the pressure i would say and this is just a good game i would say like to when i'm in pressure i don't think you know i can control it i'm like same as everyone i'm scared and i don't know what's gonna happen but i'm just trying to see how i'm gonna deal with it and if i can give advice every time i was like yeah, I have this pressure, but this is what I do every day. This is what I live for. So I know what to do and I'm just going to do it. When I think this and when my brain is completely thinking like this, it's all the time when I did the, the best runs in my life pretty much. So if I can give you a tip, you're going to feel the stress for sure. You're going to feel the pressure. Just try to remember why you're here and um, why you start started being on this bike and if you can do it right now too because sometimes it's a run if it's the world champ but in the end you're just gonna ride your bike on a super sick course so this is what you like to do so just do it and yeah. uh it works it works sometimes <laughs> no it does that's epic 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 advice i couldn't agree more uh i think understanding that everyone feels the same if they if they want to do their best run they're going to be a bit more uncomfortable. And I think that's where it comes mm -hmm. from. Going, pushing yourself to an unknown that is uncomfortable and that brings anxiety, brings all this pressure. And like you said, someone's going to go, yeah. I f I, oh, I don't feel normal. No, you can't feel normal in a situation you haven't, <laughs> no. you haven't been in. So yeah. a, a Greg Manar might feel a little bit more comfortable at the top of a world champs run because he's won it three times or four or whatever. Yeah, and because is, he's, right? he's grown so he's, from it. He's more used to it, but he used to feel just like you. So you're just in a little bit of an unknown situation, but everyone feels that way. And that yeah. means you care. And that and means, it means you're present in the moment. Like, oh, this is a big moment. But being aware of it is key, not to block it. Like you say, okay, yeah. cool. I feel pressure. What do I do about it? Okay, well, I have a breathing technique or Thomas, <laughs> Thomas mentioned like I should trust that I have ridden my bike a million times down a hill. So you know, <laughs> I can I can do this even though it feels like I don't know where my brakes are. So uh, I love talking yeah. about it and it is a special feeling. But I think like you said, the guys that want to be on the podium or do well or the reason you're entering a race or the reason you're entering a slope style or whatever is because you have some form of competitiveness and to improve and to improve, you have to push yourself outside of your comfort zone. And with that yeah. brings a, a lot of emotions. For sure. Because to me, if it's, if what you do feels easy and feels like no stress, it means that maybe you're not pushing too much, you know? So I feel like if you're pushing yourself, Either you're a genius and you're 10 times better than everybody and you don't have to stress to win. I don't know if this ever really happened, but I feel like if you want to be better, you will push yourself. And if you will push yourself, you will feel all of those, all of those things that will make you be scared in the end. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I think there's so much comes from the post pushing yourself out of your comfort zone. Now, I'm not saying if you're scared of a jump, push yourself out of your comfort zone. We, you know, like, let's be realistic where everyone is that's maybe mm -hmm. listening to this. At the top level, you accept yeah. certain risks and you sometimes have an, a, a dialogue about that. Like you said, okay, if I crash, I could hurt my knees or whatever it is. 
But I think there is so much fulfillment and growth that comes from pushing yourself, like you say, out of that comfort zone, whether that's work, relationship, uh, hobbies on the side, like, you don't grow unless you push yourself past where you think you can go. Like you said, if it's easy, you're probably not pushing yourself. Yeah. Or you're you're uh, competing against guys that are just not on your level, right? I just feel it even with the music, actually. Like when I'm trying to do new songs, I always have different kind of beats. And if I if I don't really try something different, I can do a song that is going to be looking like another one super easily. And when I'm like trying to do something different, this is where suddenly all the questions comes, you know, like I was like, okay, I could do this flow, but why am I trying this one? Or what am I, why am I saying something I've never said before? Is it like, are people gonna listen that? Are gonna like? Are, are they gonna like that or not? And um, I feel like it's the same as in the bike world. You know, like when I stay in my zone, I can do songs, but I'm not sure in the end if I really enjoy them. This is a creative thing, so it's a bit different. But like, I I feel all all all, all those uh, questions and not stress or no like pressure, but I feel like in doubt when I'm trying a new things, when I'm trying to do a new kind of chorus or a new flow in my, in my verse or just another style, you know, in the music game. And I feel like this is what I like also, you know, this is why I didn't really find my real beat style or like when you listen to my music, I don't know if you do, but it's, um, you don't have to, but when you listen to my music, there is many, many different kind of beats and uh, approach that I don't have a defined style yet. Yeah. But I feel like this is maybe also a part of me. I just, I love so many different kind of things that I can't stick to one style. So I feel like I want to try all the time something, you know, like I try to improve. I always try to be better and I want to listen my songs and be proud of it. And it's super hard. It's super hard to listen yourself. I mean, to me, like when I listen my songs, I never know what to think about them. Even when people tell me this one is insane good, I don't really think it's insane good. It's so hard to accept it or to be a positive judgment on your art. When it's biking, you can know what you like in biking and what good biking is for you. And you try to to recreate it maybe but like music is uh is another even another game but i feel like sometimes it helps me even for biking because biking is more standard i would say like it's just a sport and a sport has more laws and rules when art can be whatever you know and sometimes you can go too far in the in the process where you think it's going to be so good and in the end it's super bad but i feel like this is good uh good learns well, i just feel like i just feel like sorry i just finished this no, but i no, just feel like it's do. so good to to have a brain hobby um that you can enjoy as much as your sport that is also my job and then you can experience two different worlds but with the same mental you know like i'm just trying to be a better version of myself in these two things but in this one this is my sport and where i know let's say a little bit of everything and the other one is more artistic and i know nothing about it i'm just new to it and i'm still learning and i'm 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 just doing the the process you know because i love it and I feel like my best songs in the end from what I, I see is the ones that that came the more like uh, naturally, you know, like when I was like, this is just me. I just I just type what I what I think right now and I do it and I go to my um, my dressing. My dressing was my studio for a long time. So I was like listening beats here and uh, trying to get some ideas and flow. And then I just ran into the, um, the dressing and start doing everything. And this is the best song I, the best songs I did. So I feel like 
I don't know. I just feel like I love the the process of uh, having an idea and try to do it. It's just the same as you have a, a idea of a combo you never tried before on the bike. And you're just like here on the rolling, talking with friends or seeing something that makes you think you can do this combo just because you've seen something different, but that make you think about it somehow. And you just drop and do it. It's kind of like how I feel about doing the music too. So I just feel like this is so related in some ways, even if I don't really expect nothing from the music when I was just expecting, I wanted to be a pro just because I wanted to write every day, you know? So I was like expecting myself to be better and to try and be pro just because I was scared to have a work and not being able to write as much as I wanted pretty much. And music is just like, I just do it whenever I want and I don't expect nothing from it. So I feel like sometimes I put pressure on myself, but I should just throw my art, you know, like put what my brains wants to, to do on this, on these songs and, and release them. I think it's something I should do more. Yeah, man. I love hearing all that. <laughs> I love the passion about it. I, I think there's a lot of similarities with this music thing. And uh, you mentioned a, f a few things like, do you think, sometimes like if you're worried about what someone's going to think about the song that could technically be like worrying about what the judges are going to think about a trick or that I have to learn this style of trick when you wrote your best is because you just did it your way and surely music yeah. if you're going to do it well or consistently you have to do it authentically to yourself but you don't really know exactly what your music style is or or how authentic you maybe can be um and maybe because you're such a, uh, you know, you're an athlete and you want to be better at a sport, you want to be better at music. So you can't listen to your music and say it's good enough because you just know maybe you're so new to it, newish, yeah. that you know you can improve. So you're never going to be satisfied. Yeah. To be honest, I've, um, I've did, uh, I think, a lot of songs actually already. And um, recently I somehow in the same in the same moment as i thought i should um change my way of being in the bike world i mean my career pretty much um i thought i should change the way of uh, my music is like change my music i just thought in the same moment about those two things so that's kind of funny but i just been like thinking that my last album was more made because of some songs that I really got inspired from this last year's. So it's a new, let's say, we call it in France, the new wave of like rap and uh, all of these aspects it, it comes with. But I feel like I'm super fan of uh, guitar and instruments. And the oldest album I can remember is um, one album of uh, Offsprings. That's called Splinter. And I, I feel like this is the first music I ever heard, you know? And I feel like this is what grew up with me because of my dad, because my dad were were listening uh, ACDC, Offsprings, Nirvana so much that I listened to that, but without knowing anything or without trying to get um, interested by it, I just listened it and loved it. And... Um, I feel like today I want to change my my way of doing music and go more into this alternative world and do more about like more songs with guitars and more like more into the rock side of it even if I'm going to still do some uh, trap and uh, hip hop and all of these things but my main um, motivation now is to go more alternative and since I'm since I said that to my producer and the, like the guy that work with me, I didn't do one song and it's been like two months. I've been buying a few beats and uh, I've been listening a lot of songs and I just feel like same as in um, before I drop in my run, I just feel like in doubt a little bit. So I don't yeah. really know how to go into this world because I love the beat I just bought and I I want to make one song that I'm super happy with, you know. And I'm scared that if I rush it too much, it's not going to be too good. 
So I still have I have those beats since maybe like like I bought my first one of this new style one month ago and I didn't type nothing on it still. I listen I listen it maybe five times in a row and I'm like thinking so much and I don't type nothing like someone would see it, you know, straight up. So I could type many things that no one will never see. But somehow I just I just keep thinking and wait for the moment where I'm gonna be ready for this. I feel like my next music are gonna be thanks to my life experience, more accurate. I mean, I always been super true in my, in my words, even if it's French and stuff like that. I just talk about my life and what's around me and what's inspiring or not inspiring in my raps. But I feel like now everything is going to be more like, I feel like the vision is more clear now into this music, but somehow I can't really yet type what I want to type, I would say, to record it. I'm supposed to go to the studio in the afternoon today, and uh, I don't think I'm going to record. I'm just going to hang hang out with my with my um, friend just because I don't feel like the text, the only little text I have is going to be good enough. I feel like um, this is funny. For, like To me, it's just like somehow life gave me a message and told me that I should do the music I really enjoy and also that i maybe should take time to step into this new world of biking where i was a bit scared to go a bit younger because i was like i'm 24 am i gonna go to free ride now free ride looks sick you know so it's not like the first time i think about living i was like slope style maybe now it's getting a bit boring to me should i should i just do like some of the guys did before and they look like they enjoy it. And it's the same with music. I wanted to do music that maybe could talk more to people or because I'm a bike rider, I don't say a lot of um, basic rap world uh, lyrics. You know, I say a lot of biking stuff and uh, what we live, what we live as uh, extreme sport people pretty much. And now I feel like I'm ready to just do, to just um, do my art with, uh, what I think about it. Sorry, it was a longer conversation, no, I but I was uh, I was even discovering it. I, I'm like thinking I, right I now think that those two ideas came uh, in the same time of my life, so that's kind of funny. But you probably I feel like understand. my next album will be will be maybe longer to come, but will be I will be more happy in the end. Let's see. We'll see in maybe 24. I think it's gonna be next year. I have to work a lot of songs now. I have some songs but, uh, that I'm gonna release this year, but the new ones is going to be from 24, I would say. Maybe. Let's see. We'll see. <laughs> I um, I think you're doing a bit of figuring out while you talk. You know, that's how we sometimes figure yeah. out our thoughts, right? So I love that you, yeah. you're letting it out here. And uh, <laughs> I don't think it's crazy that you're discovering a new path for your music and your biking at the same time. I think it's an internal discovery you've made yeah. like mm, i wasn't quite lesson. following exactly the authentic path i should i think people in life love seeing that i think mm -hmm. in this day and age it's go to university it's get a job it's pay off the loans it's get a house like i think people really respect people that go no i'm not doing it the way society thinks we should do it or it looks like we should no that's bullshit especially this day and age you can make money from podcasting that's talking, you're literally having a conversation and putting it into the World Wide Web. And someone like Joe yeah. Rogan is a gazillionaire because of it, right? And this is what I can't relate to, right? Is the creative process. It's probably not how my brain is inclined. It doesn't mean I can't learn. It doesn't mean I can't have a facet of that. But are, yeah, you, but I, are you not scared? I think you're still creative. Yeah, because but are you you're not doing scared this. of fate? Yeah, yeah, but that's reinventing myself. But here, here's what I'm noticing, though, is if I didn't start the podcast and I couldn't understand my style of podcasting and I couldn't improve, if I took a year to go, what's my style? Uh, how am I going to ask the questions? Is it an interview? Is it casual? Are there going to be life lessons? And I like, but I was like, fuck it. What's the worst thing that can happen? Now, I'm wondering if you're in this new genre, scared of failure, and you won't put anything on paper because you're scared you'll be judged or you're scared you'll judge yourself. 
you know, and the only way through is sometimes by doing, even if it's failure and then you improve and then you do a next one, you know, like the first bit of mm-hmm. writing doesn't have to go in the song, right? Just for me to understand no. the process. It, <laughs> even it the song, like. Doesn't have to go in the album. Yeah. You can also record 10 different songs on one beat, you know, like you can type yeah. 10 different texts and with 10 different flows on one beat. So you're pretty free. I just feel like um, the music industry is uh, is made to push every artist to try and get more listeners pretty much, you know, like they tell you every month, yeah, this month you had this amount of um, listeners, blah, blah, blah. Like there is a lot of settings that you can see at the end of the year, you can see how many people listen, blah, blah, blah. And I, I got into this for sure. Like at some point I was like, enjoying it so much that I wanted to see if I could uh, get more people with me, you know? And uh, I don't think getting more people with you is going to come with doing something more normal, I would say, like more accurate to everybody. I would say I figured out this winter that getting more people is just me doing, is going to be about me doing better music, whatever the style or the the things I'm going to say in it. Because someone told me at Masters of the this year, some guy said, in the end, music is music. So he was like, I don't understand French, but I understand music. So when you do good music, whatever you say, if the rhythm is good, I will, I will get the vibe and get this energy. So this is why maybe some of the guys listen to your songs and don't even understand nothing. Same as me when I listen Italian rap. I don't, I don't speak no word in Italian, you know, and I, I still like it because I understand the, the rhythm and the fact that they have another flow with their language and stuff like that. So I was just thinking I should do what I want, what I like, and try to be better and better into what I like. That's it, you know. If I do 3K views on this song and 100 on the song I like 10 times less, it's okay. You know, it's not my choice. I just do what I can do, what I like to do. If I'm releasing this song, it's because I like it at some point, somewhere. If 10 people like it, I'm okay with it. If 1,000 people like it, I'm, you know, like it's not, in the end, it's not changing a lot to me, for sure. Like it's a hobby. And my dad was telling me at some point that um, I should not care too much about um, how much money it cost me or if I'm getting more views and uh, if I'm getting back some money from it, it was like, this is a hobby and people that have hobby, they don't do it for, for money back, you know? So like when, when your friend is buying a motocross and go to the, to the motor track every, every weekend, it costs him some money, but he does it because he loves it. And he's like, do you enjoy what you do? And I was like, yeah, I, I just need it, you know, like, I don't even try to do it. I just go on my car. The first thing I do is listen beats or like, you know, trying to rap on anything, like any kind of noise or like sometimes I'm just putting some techno playlist and I'm trying to rap on this. And he was like, if you have fun doing it, just keep going. Just do what you like and listen to the guys that are around you to improve it because this is like you're mental and this is how I am and I want to be better all the time at what I do. But I want to be better for myself in the end also. When I listen this song or when I make it listened by my very good friend that I know exactly what he likes in life, if he says this song is, is sick, I'm going to listen to it. This is my biggest win in the end, you know. I'm not trying to like... I was going to try to get more attention from people. I mean, get new people to listen to my stuff and I was like, this is not the right way to do it. Like, I don't need to try and get new people that I don't know. Let's try to make my people listen to it. And if Fetko is listening to my song and telling me I love this, then I won, you know, yeah. even if he's the only one listening it in the end. So this is what I realized this winter pretty much. And uh, that's why maybe I'm scared now to to do the new ones. But... Um, I know that I love it, and as soon as I will be clear ideas, I want to do a project. So I, I wanna, I plan like maybe eight songs. 
So for sure, there is a lot of uh, thinking before doing it, I would say. I kind of want it to be like proper made, not just like do songs and throw them together. I'm, I'm trying to think about the whole story. And, you know, when I look back at some albums from like the the more classic albums, they had stories and they had like they they made it in a way where it became a classic, you know. I'm not trying to become a classic. I just try to improve it and see what I should um, take from my head to put on this uh, music to make it real. Like, what's the the truest way to do this music, pretty yeah. much? Yeah. Have you heard the saying, like, trying to please everyone, you'll please no one? And that would pray mean in music, like, if you're trying for everyone to listen to it, then no one's going to like it or listen to it. Like yeah. doing your stuff, there are other people in the world that will resonate with your style, right? Mm -hmm. Like if it's a hobby, you're not trying to be mass market anyway, right? No. And if you're not if if I... you're like true to a hobby and you're not trying to make money, then maybe because I do this with a side hobby, I'm competitive with golf and it comes up a bit on the podcast. And sometimes it's like, mm-hmm dude, you don't play this game for money. Why do you give a shit? But I give a shit because yeah. I want to improve. Yeah, and I want to sure. be the best I can be because I don't have to race anymore. So that's where it comes in. There's a connection of if you do something, yeah. but I do biking at this level, so maybe I don't want to suck at this level, right? So there's that like internal thing for you. and But also yeah. I follow a bit of the comedians, right? That I follow their thing and they speak a lot about, you know, there's – everyone has a different way I think to get the creative process out and writers have the same problem. And sometimes the guy will go, well, I'm a writer. So I get up and I write whether I use mm -hmm. the, whether I write one sentence or a page or two words I wrote that day. It doesn't yeah. that mean I have to use it, you know? And, yeah, for sure. And I think you going through a creative process, it sounds to find my style. And then once you find your style, because it might be a bit tough, like, shit, I haven't written something for two months, but you're trying to find your style. And then when the time is ready, you'll probably start writing and then you'll be like, well, okay. But I, I, I'm super interested because I don't <laughs> have the style of hobby and I don't have that creative bit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I just fell into it pretty much. Like I just, um, I was in school and I was not a big fan of school, obviously, because I just wanted to write that much that I was uh, a bit uh, too hyperactive in, in class. And one of my back <laughs> back uh, class friend was uh, typing text when I was maybe two years before the end of it. So I was maybe like 15, 16. And I was like, what are you talking about in this text? You know, and it was like, this is rap and I'm, I'm trying to do some some raps and blah blah blah, and he showed me some stuff and how it was supposed kind of to be made. So like it was like okay, so this is the rhymes, this is A B B C blah whatever, and I was like getting to, I I was like getting attention to it, and this guy was not a super good friend, you know, it was just a guy, like the only thing that I was um interested by him was this you know this world more than the person he was and um it somehow like gave me like um a like uh a, a idea where i should maybe do my music with my my thinking you know and i was like looking at the youtube music and i was like no one really do in france actually music for writers like for people like me like when I listen to to the rap music today, those people don't have the same life and they don't say the same things that I'm living most of the time. Sometimes for sure you can identify yourself. And I was like, I want to make songs for my writers, you know. And I started with Bar Spin. That was a song where if you don't ride bikes, you won't understand nothing pretty much. And um, it started in this good way to me, you know. I started it by like by patient and I was like, okay, I'm going to do song for the writers. And then I was like, okay, but the writers in France, I mean, in with the French saying, it's going to be such a tight, uh, small public that I'm going to try to uh, express myself more 
as a human more than as a writer. So I learned how to say a little bit more about my life next to the bike things. And in the end, when I do some texts where I not talk about biking at all, I feel like there is an empty side at some point. You know, there is an empty part. Like, I feel like I can be saying a lot of stuff about my life in one song, but if I don't say about no writing, then it missed something because on a daily week where I'm going to take all these informations and type them into my text, I'm going to write for sure. So there is no way I can do a full text. I mean, a full song without talking about nothing that reminds us about biking, you know, or at least like maybe it can be super subtle. Like you don't really know it if you're not in the bike world, but if you understand it, you know that it's about biking. I feel like this is important to me. And I was just trying to talk to the normal range of people. And I'm like, no, I want to talk to writers, you know, like I want to motivate this kid to send this double flip or I want to, I want to be in this guy ears when he's going to warm up for his sesh. And he's, if he's talked to listen some Lil Moan before he's writing, then I motivate my, my people, you know, like to me, the bike world is, um, uh, I've met so much uh, insane people and amazing humans that I want to keep it in this world, you know, like I don't have to go too much away from it. So let's see what happens next. <laughs> That's awesome. It sounds like you have found your niche, you know, is, is authentic yeah. to yourself. I mean, like, yeah. Maybe giving back to the mountain bike community, like here's some music made by a mountain biker for the mountain biker. Also yeah, about like, life and, and your ups and downs. I think it's awesome. Yeah. And I watched yeah, those what... edits where you literally, I mean, just think about that. You're, you're rapping in an edit and writing. I mean, that's, you don't you yeah. can't replace that. There's only one Lemoyne. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I have a new video project this year and I usually have the song that come that comes first every time I did some. And uh, this time I feel like I'm almost going to do my video before I'm going to do the song. Just because I feel like um, I don't want to prepare the song before the video somehow. And I feel like I should maybe listen myself. So I'm, I'm probably filming before this summer. And I don't even know what's going to be the kind of music. And usually I have the music and I'm like, okay, we're going to do this edit on this. You know, like, oh, we're going to do this music for this project. And this time I don't know if it's going to be a hip hop or a punk rock or more house funky beat. You know, I'm just going to ride, see what we have as the writing part of it. And uh, I will do a song after that. That's sick. We'll so the other way around, you often had the music style and then you you would match the the video and the writing sort of to it, right? Kind of, yeah. Edit to it, but now you're going to go the I don't other really way. know. Yeah. I want to do, like, I'm just going to do the video that I'm planning. is It's more normal, I would say, than, let's say, the project I did with the alien guy and stuff like this. I want to be, I want to do more um, easy understanding visual things, you know, in this video. So I'm just going to focus on the writing and the um, enjoying process i would say because i want to show what i like on the bike you know what makes me be happy on my bike so i'm gonna do the tricks i really feel like i can do and i i'm gonna maybe refilm five or ten times the trick until i think it's super dialed more than trying to do a new big trick that i didn't really like did before i just want to i just want to be the truest i can be in this video and just show that this is my writing style and uh, this is what i can do best in this style and obviously you can do always best and always different so there is many different ways to do it but for sure it's going to be a big bike video this year um but yeah i feel like it's exciting not to know What's the song? What's the beat that could match with this yet? I just feel like after I'm writing and I got all the tricks done, I will be way more free to 
just throw anything into the music and maybe I have more of the direction of it. I just want to try really like I always do the the songs first. Now I just want to do the writing first and I feel like it's almost the hardest part, hardest part to do the writing than the song because the song is just is just a way of um, doing your own art when writing people know what's a good writing and what's not too good writing so you're gonna be i have more to prove on the bike than on the music i would say so let's see that's wicked but like you say you're <laughs> doing it a different way so you're it's new so it's uncomfortable it's probably no wonder yeah going back to what we spoke about but yeah I yeah for sure yeah i can't uh not pick a part which was one of the craziest things i've seen to go back a bit to whistler is mm -hmm. what on earth made you do that <laughs> <laughs> the stunt <laughs> the gap the stunt the jump this was, uh, over the last feature yeah that was that was a. Uh... That was actually something super sick this week. Uh, we went in Whistler for like two weeks. And um, the first day we arrived, we were um, taking the, the chairlift up. And the first thing I said about the course to Tim, so that is um, another slope rider, but one of my best friends. And um, the first thing I told him was like, why did I put this, um, like this... Uh, would up the step up you know usually it's a, like leap and to step up but there is nothing in between and i was like do you think I, we can use this to jump everything and the first thing they all answered me even edgar um the the brother of team and team was like no this is like they all lost you know they were like this is impossible but in my mind since since so long i wanted to either jump something in joyride or in the crank roots or either do like step up manual all the way and gap and i thought about it for so long in my whole life and i never really got the the moment to do it or like found the good the good stuff to do it or the right time and this year as i thought about it first thing it it came back to my mind so many times you know before we even tried the course like I was looking at it at every chairlift up and I was oh, like, Oh shit. It just kept coming thinking back. Thinking it was, yeah, it was possible. And I was like, I told it to my dad, I think on the phone and he was like, yeah, but maybe this is not going to be um, treated well by the judges because my dad obviously wants me to do good. So he was like, you're just going to do a jump. Maybe it's too dangerous for the, um, like the result he can give you in the end. And I was like, yeah, but I, I really want to do it like no one really I mean yeah Brandon did some of those things before but every time someone tried something like that it was super like impressive to me so I was like to me today to do a run that could impress myself I have to do everything before but I feel like if I jump this this is the the final game you know like this is my my dream run kind of so it was like, if you think you can do it and you prepared for it, do it. But like, don't get injured like super bad for something like that. But when he said that, I wanted to do it even more. So I was like, just thinking all week about it. And to be honest, I think I jumped it like step up, ride, step down. I mean, drop maybe five times in, in total. Um, just the day or two day or the day before the day of uh, the contest because I knew I was going to try something. So it was going to be either the jump or either the manual. And I was so ready for it that I didn't even try to get another trick or like another option. I was like, this is going to be one option. It's either I land it or maybe I, I explode in my run, but in both case, I want to try, you know? And, um, I did all my tricks before, all, all of my, my run I had to do, so I did it in practice. And this last day, maybe one hour or two hours before the, the show, I was, okay, this is time, you know, maybe I, I have to try once. Maybe I at least have to figure out the speed and stuff. I don't know if I'm going to do it in practice, but I if I want to try, it's going to be now. Like, it has to be now before, before the runs. And I went with Adrian Laurent, that you might know, 
Uh, he's a um, good crank race rider too, and good overall rider. And he he was with me and figuring out the speed, and he was like, "Okay, I feel like this is the good speed, but just think about gapping the wood, not not going too much over it, because if you just pass the wood, maybe you'll be in the landing." And I was like, "Yeah, this is true." And then I was going up the wood, and I was like. I'm maybe gonna jump this super easy, so maybe I'm gonna go way too far. But maybe yeah. if I case the end of this wood, I'm gonna die. You know? Yeah, so that's worse. Casing the wood is way worse. What are the options? Worse. Yeah. This is this is what I I thought going into it, and I was like, before my last try, I was like, in the end, I prefer gap it a little bit more than case. So I went for the first go, and I went, let's say, 90% speed, and I. Like Laurent would have say go 70 and I was like, yeah, I will go 70 and I went 90% because I just got scared to K. So I was like going in and obviously I went too far and I was a bit sideways because just the, the first uh, roll on the way up to jump made me go a little bit like that. So I was like not feeling so good and it's so scary. It was so scary to me because you don't see the landing. So you go up the lip and there is this plate of wood. And this is only what you do. So it feels like a boner log for us. But then there is the this wall flat thing. And you just go and you don't know where is the landing until you're like over this and you can start spotting it, you know. But when you're there, it's too late to do anything. You just either do it or not. And uh, I crashed the first, um, the first try then because I went way too far. I hurt my, my hand a little bit. I got it checked and um, like strapped. And I had two laps before the final. So after this, after this try. So then I was like, okay, I did it. I crashed, but I kind of know the speed now. And I had one more trick to do. It was the double flip. I had um, on the first double in the run. So he put the, the strap to my hand. I tried one. I stopped after the two doubles. I went back up and they said, um, this is your last run. And then we start the show. So then I went, I did my first double flip because I didn't do it yet. I landed perfect. I was like, okay, this is the good, like, this is going to be a good day. You know, like this is every settings of my runs are done. I crashed. I'm a bit in pain, but I can do it. Now I, I know where I'm going. So after that, I was feeling so, so great. I feel, I feel like if I didn't do the double flip just before my run, it would be a different draw right for me really the fact that i was feeling a bit of pain and when did my last trick for my run made me made me feel so good that i just think let's go you know this is draw right this is the moment we wait all year like this is what i live for like those people are here the hype is insane there is not even one second of being scared when you drop, you know, before you drop, for sure, this is always the same feeling. But when I drop in, I started with a manual. So I was like <laughs> super stressed about it because uh, you can miss a manual so easily. I was like, okay, let's do it. And then I did it. I missed one trick in my run because I land actually my first double flip um, a bit too far. And I was like doing bar to tuck ex instead of a cash roll on the next drum. So I was thinking, my run will be scored not that good. And I was like, okay, I don't care. This is draw ride. There's no way to give up, you know, like I missed one trick, but I'm, I didn't crash. So I can probably have a proper, I mean, an okay score in the end. So I just keep it going. I did all the tricks. I went down there and I was like, okay, this is now, you know, like this is not going to be the best run ever. But if I jump this and I land it, I'll be already super happy. And I did it and pedal and went way too far, but landed it. And um, when I saw like all the reactions from the people, I was like shocked, you know, I was like, wow, this is, uh... so this is talking to people as much as I thought it would, you know, like I just, I just wanted to do it for myself, but I didn't know if people are going to react to this. Maybe they're going to just think I jumped like just a jump and they're going to, not understand why I didn't do a trick or something. So I was like, I don't know how the judge are going to judge this, how the people are going to think, 
how sick it is or not, you know. And um, I saw a lot of uh, super sick reactions and so much people came to me before the second run. They were like, wow, this is insane, blah, blah, blah. And I knew I could do better in my second run because of one of the jumps. So I was, I was uh, switch off my brain mode and I was just like, like I knew everything, you know. For once I was dropping with no pressure because I was maybe fifth or fourth before second run. So my mission, everything was already done. Yeah. The, um, the the best thing I could do is go on the podium, but I, I was not even thinking I could do it. I was like, I just try to do everything I, I can do best on this run and we'll see, you know. And I started with no pressure and I changed my first trick randomly pretty much. I was like going into it and I was like manually and I was like, I'm going to change this, uh, upgrade kind of this trick because I did manual bar for so long. I mean, for a few times. So I was like, this time I'm going to do tuck. And I did the tuck and I didn't do one manual tuck in Whistler before this run. And as soon as I landed it, I was like, okay, this is the run, you know, like this is going to happen. I'm going to do everything. And then I got like, I just rode with fun. I did like all the tricks. Like I, I controlled everything. I was not like super confident. You know, I was just like enjoying the moment and I was just, thinking I can't crash because I have to go again there and jump this, you know. I wanted to jump it clear. To be honest, if I had another try, like a last try, maybe I was going to try something on it. I needed one more try if I what, wanted like to do... like a tuck? Could you tuck? Like a trick, a yeah. Tra a tuck or a bar spin or... You can you can always think about a crazier thing. So it's it depends on... Crazy. What your brain tells you this day, it you know, but so insane. I was like side yeah. view from the GLC, and <laughs> I looked at your speed yeah. check, and I was like, "This guy is gonna jump this thing." No yeah. way. We're looking at everyone. He's gonna jump it. No, he's not gonna jump it. And then we're all gonna. <laughs> A lot of people told it to me. Also, some people came to me the week of Joyride, and they were like, "Hey, we were thinking someone will jump this thing," and. In this discussion, we only thought you can do it. And I was like, not telling them nothing really. Like I was like, <laughs> yeah, I think it's possible too. And I was like, those people think about it and they came to say it to me. And I'm thinking about this since the first day. So it has to, crazy. to be a try, you know, like I have to give it a try. And I was almost ready to, to break my legs on this because on the first go, like I was on the Bonner log landing and I was like, I can break my legs when I'm landing maybe five meters too far because I don't know where I'm going to land right now. I have yeah. no clue what's going to happen. And I was like, I'm, I'm ready to handle it. Like this is Joride. If I, if I'm getting injured here right now, this is like, this is why I'm here for, you know, like I can, I will accept it. And I was like, okay, let's go. And I just tried to hold on as much as I could and be like, let's see. And I saw, as soon as I went out of this, I was like, okay, I'm already there. And the landing was maybe here. And I was like, I'm for sure going to gap so much. And um, after I crashed, I was like, now I know I can't go longer. I'm just going to go a little bit slower. So it has to be just better in the end. Like the landing has to be better. So, yeah, it just made me more motivated to do it in the end was sick it was a sick moment in my life like it was like i want something more than the full run you know when i landed it my my full body my brain was like happier than any other competition i did before and i didn't even know what was gonna be my spot on the ranking i was just like Pwah, i did it you know so it felt it felt like different it felt good <laughs> That's probably epic. one of the best feeling I had pretty, pretty can, much on the I bike. I can only imagine. And I mean, I could ask you for a career highlight, even though your career yeah. is already done. That's certainly probably it, man. That's so epic. Yeah. yeah. To do something, you know, it's, it's a first and no one else wants to do that would do it. I, I think that's, that's an epic way to sort yeah. of like finalize your decision of competitive slope style, like full seasons, you know, and maybe a good way to start like winding this down. I think what an epic way yeah. to fin finish the podcast, probably on a high. I don't know how much higher <laughs> we, we can go, you know? <laughs> yeah. 
Um, is... Yeah, I just I just felt like I just felt like slop style was going a lot into the same directions in the last years, and uh, I thought it was good to keeping the like the creativity, you know, from from each other's. I feel like I don't want to see everyone write the same way and do the same kind of tricks to add one more bar spin or tail whip to beat the other guy. I just love that everyone has his own style and do his own things. And that motivated me to just keep going with my ideas, you know, like if I has, if I have those ideas in so long and I want to do these manuals and these jumps, maybe it's not going to be judged as the best tricks, but this is how I want to ride. So I just ride like this, you know, and I could try so much more bar spin and opposite combos. And I never really liked riding in opposite, like opposite 360s and stuff. I did some at some point when I tried to get into this hype. And um, I feel like today I will never do another opposite 360 in a slope style run. And I don't feel bad about it because this is my riding. This is how I ride, you know. I'm just trying to be honest with my own style and be better with this own style I have and make it grow how it is more than change it, you know. So it was like a good ender to to my thoughts about doing a good slope style run. Like to me, my best slope style run ever had to to put something like this in in it. You know, like if it was not something special in it, then it was it was probably not gonna be Thomas Lemoyne best run ever. I would say. Yeah, you put your style and and, and authority on like what you wanted to get out of slope starts you know your yeah. unique thing i think that's so so epic now this question has been burning but it's probably a little bit maybe <laughs> rude to put you on the spot i was wondering i don't know if you do freestyle rapping if you could like yeah. freestyle rap an ending or something <laughs> that has moving the needle in or something about coming on the podcast um, i'm putting you on the spot I don't know if there's a I way can, to incorporate can moving freestyle. the needle. Uh, the I can pod- freestyle, but I need like a beat. Oh, well, that, um, you're not going to get that from me. Can we get we'll get yeah. a beat from your phone? Yeah, I can. <laughs> I, I can't beatbox, so I don't know where we're going to get the beat. I can't really do it in English, though. No, just if it's fun for you, this would be cool. And then, you know. <laughs> it can be listeners. so shit, too. Because I'm just a human and sometimes I'm just freestyling and I'm hey, just thinking it's super bad, you know? There's no judgment. Maybe you can that we can end the podcast with the Lemoyne, <laughs> Lemoyne freestyle. Maybe I just remix one needle. of my... Uh, oh, you want me to freestyle about this? Well, could you? Like in, incorporate the word moving the needle? Uh-huh. <laughs> like just once. Something, um, but it can be... Bipolar. How do you pronounce it? Moving the needle. Moving... Moving the needle. But you can well, do man, it in, you, you, you put pressure on me. No, I don't want to put pressure on you. Um, the needle is the... Um, is it yeah, that it's small... Like the, yeah, the small thing. Okay. Like my ankles. Yeah. Um, I, what's the French name of this? An aiguille, I think. Yeah, yeah, do it. So move, you know what move means? Yeah, déplacé. Yeah, yeah right. you're moving. Déplacé. I have a um, hip hop classic. Let's do it. Kind of beat. Um, wow. I like, I like it. <laughs> I like it. Hey, yeah. C'est Lil Moine dans le mic. Hey, j'arrive sur un podcast avec Andrew. On déplace cette aiguille. Tu sais qu'on va faire du ride jusqu'à aiguille au bike park. Je suis avec tous mes potes, je en freestyle Je fais pas trop de rimes, mec, c'est trop le Wow, je suis dans les vibes, mec, et je suis dans l'espace Je suis comme un terrien, mais je suis pas un terrien Je fais des trucs de malade, je suis dans les airs, yeah Wow, Céline, moi, je suis sur le mic Céline, moi, je suis dans ton putain de Spotify En podcast, en son, on est hal, on décale Dans les airs, sur le bike, on se casse Je fais des tricks de ouf, mais je m'en bats les couilles Je dis des gros mots, des fois, mais je suis désolé 
je fais des rimes de temps en temps quand j'écris c'est un peu mieux que quand je pars en intro <rire> I don't know. Yes, dude. I'm just talking. That almost. is so sick. Um, I, I like the try. beat. Yeah. No, that was incredible. Yeah, the beat is sick. Dude, the beat is so sick. I dude, hope there is uh, not that, too many Frenchies that will listen to that. That is perfect, my man. I love it. It was uh, completely impro. Yeah. I like to. It's easy. I mean. Sorry, I just keep on the beat. It's easy for me to. Dude, that was so To wrap my text. Cool. But I feel like the um, the adrenaline is better when I'm just trying to improve and I'm like, okay, if it's shit, everyone is gonna hear it, hear it in a in a shit way. But th this is the challenge. I don't <laughs> think it's shit. I put you on the spot, and that was like gave me goosebumps for you to like do it just <laughs> in the in the moment. And I think that's how we should end it off because maybe that's the start of the new style of uh, your your rapping. of podcasting. Well, maybe a podcast. It's a, <laughs> it's a first for me, but that was really special. That that makes it worth um, it, dude. I did it. I did it because I have a good feeling with um, with this with you. Because a lot of time people ask me, and if I don't really feel like doing it, I'm not doing it. Oh, but um, sick. I had fun this morning, so I'm happy um, that I did it. But don't think it was good because if you listen in French, it was just something. Some are words. You, are you? But, uh, can you translate it for me and send me the text later? I, like, this was completely impro, but I said yeah, that no, but you I was. Just, um, yeah. Oh yeah, I can. Yeah, I what, can, no, tell us what it was, because the English people. Yeah, I was telling that I was uh, taking the mic on a podcast, and I was with you, Andrew, moving the needle. Um, I was saying that I, I'm doing tricks on the bike, and I, I do whatever, whatever I like, kind of. Uh, I don't even remember what I said Wicked. because it was uh, completely freestyle. The, but yeah, the beat and the rhythm was great, dude. I mind. was like jamming to it. <laughs> it was cool. I like I like that beat actually. This could be one of the maybe the beat for the next edit. I was yeah. thinking about it, but maybe not when I whatever. But when I think about it, I don't think it's gonna be this one. But yeah, thank you for for putting pressure on me. I felt like it was almost a. Uh, I had to do a run. Yeah, you were like, <laughs> I'm like dropping and you were like, uh, okay, I'm ready. Let me get the beat. <laughs> no, dude, that was sick. I, I look forward to meeting up. Hopefully uh, it happens this year. And if not, I'll follow along the For music, sure. follow along the edits. Uh, they can find you on Instagram. Where can they find the music? I'll link it in the show notes um, as well. Lil Moin. Uh, my name, my rap name is Lil Moin and you can find it on every streaming platforms or YouTube. Spotify, if you look for it, you stuff. will find it. If yeah. you wait for it to be on the radio, you will never hear it. <laughs> nah, underground is the best, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, actually, it's sick. Yeah, hit him up on, on Instagram. If you haven't seen this, the jump at Whistler, just check it out. It's pinned on his uh, Instagram profile at Thomas Lemoyne. But I'll, I'll link a few of those things in the description because they're epic to see. And then uh, you guys know what to do. If you like this episode or you got some value, maybe the one thing you can do is share it with a friend. I think that's the biggest love you can give to the podcast. Otherwise, follow the show. Till the next one, peace. Yo, big up.